Hi, welcome to part three of building a face jug. As you know, we have started uh, on our face jug um, in two previous uh, videos. And this is a particular kind of approach to face jugs. It's coil building, which is a fairly traditional approach. So we're doing coil building. And at the same time, we're also thinking about um, building the facial features from the bottom to the top. So as we work, we begin to develop the chin, the mouth, the nose, the eyes. It all kind of goes, fills in from the bottom to the top. So this is part three. We've already seen the, the chin and the mouth. We've seen the nose develop. And now we're going to get into the eyes and the forehead and the brow and that sort of thing. Um, the, you can perhaps notice that the environment has changed. We went from the, uh, the studio at Solano Community College to this little carport workspace that I have at home. And you can see all around me here, you can see all kinds of things. There's a couple of sculptures um, in bronze over there. And then in the distance, you can see a, a ceramic sculpture on a post. Um, here's the piece we'll be working with right there. And then um, we continue to our little tour. Um, you can see all kinds of materials waiting to be made into something. And then there's a rack with some cups waiting to be painted. And here's a, um, a kind of experimental sculpture I'm making. It looks kind of like a river stone or a big egg or something. It's got a lot of texture facing down on that uh, plow disc um, that it's sitting on. And then in the distance, you can see lots of sculpture, um, both in the foreground and the background um, from this area in my in my at my home in my yard so here is where we're working right now and the goal is to demonstrate more of this coil building from um, the bottom to the top we have a chin we have a mouth you can't really see it from this vantage point but the mouth has porcelain teeth in it now uh, we have a nose and the venue has changed as i say from solano community college back to my home um, I was working on this uh, at 12 hours ago at the college, and now I hope to finish it up uh, here. So I'm applying coils of clay. There's one here in progress. I'm just working on getting a good join as we get started again. And this kind of thing is possible in in uh, coil building is that you can build for a while. You can, you can work until perhaps the coils get too loose to the clay is so it gets too soft and you begin to worry about the piece collapsing. So what you do is you wait for it to stiffen up. And now it has stiffened up quite a bit. So it'll support me going up higher. And that's a really good method. And that's one of the reasons that with coil building, you can really build um, all the way, you can build as tall as you want. Your only real limitation, as you might imagine, is the size of your kiln. You want to make sure you don't build a piece bigger than the kiln. A mistake I've only made once, it's fairly recently. And so we're, we're now in an interesting uh, part of this project, I don't know for sure that you'll want to work on something this large. It is quite a commitment. Um, it'll probably end up being about three bags of clay. Um, it's, as you can see, just the, the labor so far has taken me, a, you know, it'll probably take me eight or 10 hours to finish this piece. It's, it's kind of a, it's a bit of a commitment. Um, so it has to be something that you're really interested in um, in creating. And that's really interest that's really a big aspect. So one of the reasons that I'm offering this um, demonstration is to show you the potential. So we've taken a tradition, a, a really um, astonishing tradition and a really deeply moving tradition of the face jug, the face jug being, this this um, artifact from a very 
very traumatic, tragic part of our American history, and which is also kind of a testament to the human spirit that these, these peoples in one of the most difficult times in their lives were capable of and willing to create um, a compelling uh, ceramic art form at a time when they themselves were experiencing the a really uh, horrifying kind of tyranny in their lives. So that's one aspect, but then they, they created these, these, these objects. And now I'm taking that idea of the face jug and I'm kind of making it much, much larger and um, exploring sculptural ideas of the human face. And I think in so doing, I make, I'm kind of allowing myself to respond to what I see as this thing gets larger and larger. I want to be able to look at it and see, well, what do I think? Where do I think it should go? How do I think it should progress as an artist? And that's really important. There's an interesting part of an article in our class that you may have read by now. Um, and the, the writer, the researcher that's quoted, um, he says that the original Edgefield face jugs really give the feeling that they're roaring. They're roaring. They're putting forth tremendous, they have a tremendous power and presence. They roar. So he says that. And then he says, whereas later, these much larger pieces that were made by white potters in the area kind of imitating the face jugs seem to whisper, even though they might be 25, 30 inches tall, they haven't nearly the presence or the power of the original face jugs. And so as an artist, I'm thinking I would really like this piece to do something visually to, for the viewer that isn't a whimper. A whisper doesn't bother me so much if it's whispering something poetic, but um, I don't want it to whimper. So um, it's something to think about um, as I work in this, in this tradition. If you've looked on in the PowerPoint lecture that I provided, you'll see the wonderful work of Clayton Bailey, who brought his own kind of inspiration to the pieces. His pieces tended to be about 10 or 11 inches tall, perhaps. Um, and then what he brought to them was a really um, kind of spirited, almost uh, comical facial grimaces and, and, and expressions, um, which were not too far off from the Edgefield originals, but he was a man of tremendous intelligence and humor and his face jugs, I really admire the work that he did in this genre, in this face jug idea. So you can see that I've already extended this another five, almost six inches, which is the, the height of one original Edgefield pot, and I've just gone that distance here. So as you look at it, um, you can see that this nose is getting quite elongated, and that really starts to be the question, how much further should I go? How far do I want to exaggerate this form? So that's kind of what I'm paying attention to as I go. And what I would hope you might do is make what the, the assignment is, is to make one jug head uh, from the simple method of, of the slab circles turned into bowls and then joined at the lip, a very simple way of construction, constructing a pot. So you do one that way, and then you do one coil built. But you don't need to go this far. You can just do one where you coil build the whole pot and then begin to add the facial features. That would be 
the way I think I would recommend going, especially early on in your efforts. And, and you're much more, you're making things much more along much more in the uh, spirit of along the traditional methods of construction of the original face jugs. You can see this is getting quite elongated. It begins to sort of, it begins to look like an Easter Island head. And how much time you want to invest in this is really up to you. If, you know, if I go, if I keep going taller and taller, I'll have to stop again or I can finish it off this time. So I'm just going to keep going here. And we'll see what feels right. The largest one of these I made was about 48 inches tall, I think. And that took me about a month. Um, to, I, it took me, I was one of the first ones I did. And it was very slow and meditative and just kind of getting to know the form and the process. And um, really a bit of a surprise for me because it, as it was one of the first I'd done, I really didn't plan to go that large. It just kind of developed that way. And I was quite um, thrilled with the power and the presence of the piece. And that happens sometimes. You start exploring an idea, and as you develop it, as you work with it, the idea takes on a life of its own and presents itself with much more presence and power. And this is starting to feel about right in terms of, I think we can start to look at um, placing an eye into this piece, start to work on the eyes. And you've seen me do that in an, a couple of earlier presentations. And the other thing you're seeing me do technically is that you see me working with four, four coils at a time, which is a more advanced approach. After you get more confident with your coil building, you might want to uh, approach that, that kind of idea of working, uh, building up a lot of clay at one time. So you can see I'm, I'm wiping the inside with the rib. And on a piece like this, at this stage, this is such an important part of the process because I'm doing a lot of joining and strengthening. I always got to, I never can leave or for a moment break focus on trying to join one coil to the next. I have to constantly be thinking about the integrity of the coil to coil joining. And some of you may have experienced that with the African with the African spherical pots that we did in the technique that we employed, what can happen is that you build it upside down, you start and build a hemisphere and then you flip it over. Well, if you let that bottom edge dry up too much, then when you flip it over to start joining again, you get a crack right there because you haven't been able to maintain a consistent uh, a damp edge to keep working with. So there's a lot of um, technical things that you're attending to as you work. As you, you know, you, you have to adhere to and pay attention to the coil building process that's going on here. So I'm looking at that and you can see here, this is quite this rises up quite tall, and this is a more kind of the, the blank area that I like to create this kind of 
concavity that kind of echoes maybe the eye socket gone wild, just much bigger, and how it kind of follows the edge of the nose into the brow idea here. And then here, what I'm looking at is maybe starting this eye quite a bit lower right there. So you can see it'll be quite an asymmetrical presentation. So let's put the, let's put an eye here. And uh, I'm not going to go through the step by step, step by step discussion of the eye. I've done that in two previous videos. So you can refer back to those if you want more information about that. So I'm just going to jump in here. So I'm scoring this eyeball. You'll see me do a kind of similar thing here. I'm just gonna build the presence of an eye. And because the clay is still soft and I can get my hand in there, I can do some things like I can I can push out the brow here. Rather than add clay, I can just kind of push that out and create a sense of the eyebrow. And I can do the same thing here. I can push out the cheekbone. See, it's changing quite a bit. I can again think about how this is concave here. This part will be concave. That's a good brow. And then it goes to convex here. That starts to look very eyebrowish. So I'm going to get tool. And again, for, for eyes, when I need to work on a sphere, eyeball shape, I have this tool. And again, very simple to create by carving into an old paintbrush. This is a paintbrush handle. And I want this eye to face forward. I don't want it to slant to the side just because the pot is turning. I want to get a forward plane as much as possible because we know that about human anatomy that the, the eyes of a human face forward and you may have heard that it is, um, it is the situation with predators that their eyes face forward and with prey eyes face to the sides to look for danger for threats. Kind of like scooping ice cream in a way.
you can see it's really uh, starting to take on some character there. Again, the eyelids just sit right on the, the ball of the eye. And which way? I think I'll have him look over, over there. So in order to get him looking that way, I create the, the iris looking that way, the iris and the, the pupil. This is, um, again, that idea in sculpture you know, in painting and drawing, we talk about chiaroscuro, and chiaroscuro is the, mani the manipulation of lights and darks to create the illusion of depth. But in sculpture, we don't need to create an illusion of depth. We just create depth. So that's what we want to do. And so what that means is when you... when you um, actually dig out a section of, of clay, when you make a dark area like this, wh well, that's exactly right. When you, when you make a hole, it, it looks dark because light is not going all the way in. Like the, it is, it's, light is really bouncing back from the surface, but here it goes inward and so it turns dark. So you're not, you're not doing chiaroscuro, you're actually manipulating three-dimensional space to create light and dark. So the impression here is one of And so what you can see me doing as I work is creating the, the various um, kind of architecture of the eye. And I'll just point out a few of the things I've talked about. This little extra piece of clay here, you can see it actually working quite well. It catches the light because it's not going inward, it's not dark. And that that is a way of imitating the every eye, every time you look at someone's eye, you'll notice there's a reflection on it. And that reflection is an imitation. It's not an imitation. That reflection is the light hitting the kind of glossy, glassy, liquidy kind of component of the eyeball. And so there's always a little bit of a highlight in the eye. You'll always see one. And so here, I leave that little bit of clay there, and that creates a sense of that highlight. It's a way of manipulating the way the light hits the form. To It's kind of the opposite of chiaroscuro. We're doing things to imitate. Well, I guess chiaroscuro is light and dark, so we are, we are kind of doing a, a, a manipulation of how the light is perceived. So you can see this fellow looks like he's looking over that way. So I'm going to leave that like that. At this point, I haven't done anything about, um, uh, I have to do handles or something. And I do need to do, um, the, I'm going to do the top now. I'm not going to worry about this eye yet, because again, as we've talked about before, it takes very little to make an impression of an eye there. And that's what I will do, is something very, some little gesture. 
that will have a lot of power to it about creating a, an impression of eyes. So now, what I want to do is find the center a bit of the center of this piece. So what I'm doing now is I'm just finding, um, I'm going to put the piece in the center of the wheel a little bit, more towards the center, and you'll see how that's helpful. And I'm, now I'm going to close it off and create the spout. So you can see I'm just building up a little bit more and the primarily the goal of that is to even it up and kind of begin to head towards creating the top, kind of weird to call it a shoulder, but it's the part where the pot turns inward towards the base of the, of the neck of the piece. And again, the neck of the piece at the top of the head, well, that's kind of a strange kind of way of thinking about about it. I'm just going to join this material in and then I'm really going to close the piece off and you'll see that. The final finish of this piece will require something. I need ears and I think I may do that with handles rather than with um, with actual ears. Um, I'll make two handles that will reflect ears. That's kind of the plan. Um, and again, no matter how exciting it gets as I work with the, the growth of the piece and, and, and one of the things, I don't know if this, if this comes across on the video, but one of the exciting things about working as an artist is what I call that 80-20 principle. The 80-20 principle for me is that as you work on anything, no matter what the medium, if you're painting, if you're sculpting, if you're making assemblage, if you're doing collage, if you're doing drawing, sculpture, pottery, everything looks, for 80% of the way, it just looks terrible. As you're working on the piece, as it's developing, it doesn't look realized or good or even interesting. It kind of looked like maybe you should just go sell real estate or something that, that you're wasting your time as an artist. If you, if you get silly and start taking it personal or something, it just doesn't look like you've achieved anything or that it'll ever amount to anything. And in reality, what's happening is you just have to build the piece. And so I built this piece and what's exciting now is that what you can see is the piece is actually starting to come alive. It's not there yet, but you can see that it is actually coming alive. It's actually starting to look like something. And I love that, you know, we all, we all cherish that part. Um, and as you work more and more in the arts, what you'll come to know um, as an experienced artist, you you don't sweat the first 80% as much. You, it's okay if something looks 
horrible because you know if you persist as an artist that's really what art making is you just keep going until it, it works until it looks right um uh, i knew an artist uh, named patrick crab and uh, boy i remember this he said this i think 35 years ago he said if uh if i'm working on a piece and it cracks it's not ruined it's just not done yet the artist doesn't stop until the piece is really resolved and i love that idea that you you never <clears throat> you never relinqu relinquish control you never relinquish control you are always the artist creating your piece so That's a nice piece of information there. Here I am going to now finish this. And as I want, as I want the coil, the, the direction of my building to go inward, which is what I want now, I want it to close up. I actually hold my outside fingers and I see I'm getting a little bit too tall for the, the video frame. So I'm gonna go up a little bit. I hold my fingers at an angle. You can see this, it's held at an angle as I'm joining the coil and that makes the coil go inward. And you can see we've really gotten, uh, we've gone a long way here. And this is only possible because we let it dry for 12 hours. It, uh, we let it rest. I finished up last night about 1030, brought it home. And now it is 12 hours later, the bottom is stiff enough to hold this kind of activity. And so we're able to go, we've already probably made, I don't know, 14 inches maybe a little bit more. So now I'm shaping the inside with the rib. And I'm going to start paddling a little bit to bring it in and to work with the shape. And I'll go back and forth with the rib and the paddle for a little while. And sometimes I can get a little over involved with my tools, but uh, I do want to assure you I've, I've provided a simple paddle Let's see where that is. can't seem to find it where did i put the paddle oh here it is very simple idea just a um a two by four with the edges softened so no sharp edges Clean off spare clay there. 
and this makes an excellent paddle for shaping. And I do want this to start coming in. And a paddle is a great way of forming, shaping, compressing, strengthening the clay. So you can see that's really coming in. And I just want to take a moment to look at the piece, to stand back a little bit. I'll spin it a little bit. Stand back and really get a sense of the piece. It's got a lot of swing to it. Kind of leans one way and then goes back the next way. I like that. So let me stop that. And this is really coming close to being finished and resolved here. Take another look at it. It's good to step back, step, step back and look at your piece as it evolves. And again, with paddling at this stage, it's really a great idea to think about your work in terms of, you know, a thousand little taps rather than two or three big ones. You really want to get it to sneak up and, and progress. Um, I want to just see where I'm at here from the wheel's point of view. Okay, not very good. So, just going to finish the top here, and we'll call it for this video. I'm going to put on handles, but that's not really that difficult to imagine. You've seen me do that for uh, on other videos. So just want to give you a sense of this image, this form completed. So we'll, we'll do that. Just going to work that in. And now we're getting to a very important part of the construction where this is the last moment where I'll be able to get my hand at all inside. I can just barely get it in as it is to work the inside. So what that means is for the next coils that I put on, I'm going to have to make sure that my thumb work, as I wipe it with my thumb, that I really do a good job because I'm not going to be able to do anything else, barely do anything else anyway. So maybe with a, I can get a finger in there, but that's about it. So something to think about as we work. We're getting very close to the finish here. And since it is the last opportunity to get my fingers in there, I want to make sure that I'm happy with the shape of the that I can get access to. And again, this piece is um, 
has been 100% coil built, the wheel has only been here as a method of turning it slowly. It hasn't, I haven't used this wheel like I did in the earlier demonstration to actually um, kind of throw and coil. This has all been coil building. And so that's important in, in part because it shows you, um, so at this stage, I'm really at a, a point where it's very, this spout is gonna show up. I think it's gonna be off to one side, I think is where I want it. So I'm going to need to be very attentive to, to the work that I'm doing. What does that mean for you? What am I trying to say here? Um, it means that it's, it can't, I can't use the wheel to do any finishing. I have to know that when I work this piece in, I'm going to have to get it to be symmetrical in the way I want it, all in, in sculpting and hand building, coil building. It's not going to work uh, to turn the wheel and finish it. I'm just wiping the clay down, really making sure I get a good join. I don't want any cracking. And let's see, where's my... Looking pretty good. So let's take a look and see what that looks like. Clearly not finished at the very top. But work it a little bit. And you can take a look at it. Let's see if I can give you a view of the whole piece. You can see the whole piece turning, but we'll have to go up a little bit for you to see the, the spout. See, it's got a nice asymmetry to it. And by that, what I mean is that it, it kind of keeps you off balance as a viewer. You're kind of looking at it and it, you can't quite get it into, into view the way you might like. So I, I like that. So it keeps your eyes constantly trying to, your eyes will constantly try to center this, even though it can't be centered. So it'll keep your, it'll keep the viewer's interest in, in many ways. I could move it over if I wanted it to be centered visually, but I'm very happy with this asymmetrical presentation. Now what I can do here is I'm gonna cut this off so that I get an even cut. That's the spout there, but I want to finish it. I want to give it a, a real finished look. And the best way I know to do that is take some clay. Clay. And I'm going to make a coil, a really even coil, as even as I can really produce it. And then I'm going to just finish the top.
and take a look at it again as it goes around. Looks like it might need a little, little work from the paddle here. And then, um, just want to score it because I'm not going to push on the outside of the coil, so I want to get a good join. So scoring will allow me to improve the chances of no cracking at the top. So I'm just scoring the coil, I'm scoring the piece. Slip on there. And I'm just going to put this around. that with my needle tool and cut through it and I'll do a little little scoring in between where I cut this coil. You can see this let me get a little taller here. You see I'm cutting this coil here. I'm scoring it and that makes a nice finish, a smooth round finish at the top, which I think is important. Whenever you're making, whether it's a, a functional pot or something more sculptural like this, the where you get to the conclusion, the finish, the very top of the piece, when you, you know, it's kind of the the I don't know the, the crescendo, the the final moment, because someone's looking at your piece, they're going to look at it and their eyes will follow it from throughout the piece and then they'll get to the top. And if the top is just kind of ragged and unfinished, it, it kind of leaves them uh, in the lurch. So you want to get a top that is much more finished. And now I'm just going to push, I'm going to wipe just the inside. Not that, I'm going to try not to misshape the outside of the coil. I'm just going to wipe the inside. It's always a little difficult because when you put slip on it, everything slides instead of moves or instead of wiping. So you've got to really work it to make sure you get what you're after. And I just get it as finished as I can. There's always the finishing when it's bone dry that you do. That's pretty good. All the way around. And then maybe a, a finale here is just to come in and, and level, it, level it off and give it a little bit of a flat top and compress the coil a little bit. This both strengths, it strengthens the joint and it also makes the shape a little bit more interesting. Kind of a little bit of a more, um, less of a, a pure round in a sort of flat top. And then any little inconsistencies where it gets a little thin here, I'm going to put a little extra clay to even that, that visual line of the inside. And really get a, a kind of a beautiful circle of the opening at the top. And carefully go around the outside and bring that right up into the finished top of the pot. And then very gently finish it off there. Okay, let's take a look and see what that looks like. Um, it's getting there. I think I have just a little bit more shaping to do. There it goes. Yeah, I just want to kind of have a little funnel outward. I like the way that looks. And there we go.
So you can see I take a, quite a bit of attention to this last detail because I really want it to represent the piece. And that's looking pretty good. So let's give it another spin. You can look at it in its completion, completed form here. It's a little fast. Let's slow it down. And I recommend before you walk away from something like this, be sure and turn the wheel off. There you go. We'll look at the whole piece there as it comes around. The only thing we're missing, and you can see it, is I haven't quite decided the eye in the abstract section there, what, what will be indicating that. So I'm going to work on that, and then we're done. There's the upper part. Right there is where I need just a second more work, not much. So what I want to do here is I want to put this, um, again, it's, it's much higher. And then you can see the eye is higher than the one below it. So it's really off asym asymmetrical, my favorite thing. The only other thing that I want to make sure that I do is having having done that, having put that piece in there, that hole, that goes all the way through, and I don't want my piece to leak. I want to maintain that, that idea. So I'm just going to redo it. Let's see what kind of tools I have to do that with. with just putting that hole in there. And then so that's closed. And there we have it. Just that little detail is all it takes. So that's as far as we need to see now. I will put some kind of handles on it and I'll perhaps post a picture of the finished piece so you can see how that looks. But there we are. So until we see each other again, stay safe and make art.